Welcome. We're so glad that you decided to join us. We are starting a new series of Sabbath School lessons entitled Glimpses of Our God. And this is a series which will be for the study uh, in, in the first quarter, first three months of 2012. And we begin this series with a lesson entitled The Triune God. That would be a three-in-one God. This lesson is for January 7 of 2012. And we would like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with the word of prayer. Our loving Father, there's no way we can begin to comprehend all there is to know about you, certainly not in this life or in the life to come for that matter. But help us to understand as much as we're capable, to understand the role that you play and the role that the Son plays and the role that the Holy Spirit plays. And may we present that as clearly as we possibly can today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Old Testament is full of a lot of passages about the one God of Israel. Why do you suppose that is? Any idea why God seems to really emphasize the fact that God is one? Well, the most, most common um, argument for that, I would probably suggest, is that there were so many cultures um, around that were uh, polytheistic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they just, uh, I, they, 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 basically the idea they would serve anything they, that they felt had some power, they were willing to serve that. And yeah. they were even willing to serve, uh, it would appear, uh, except the Israel, mm -hmm. the, the God of Israel, because, well, he seems like a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty powerful guy. We better, let's, let's, you know, we'll serve him too. Yeah. So that, that would be my first initial response. So we have verses like Deuteronomy 6, 4. I hope it's familiar to all of you. If you, want, if you have your Bible handy, we would really encourage you to open the Bible and join us. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, want you to understand that we're not misquoting anything here. And I'm, I'm quoting from uh, the Good News translation here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Some translations have that worded a little differently. The New King James has, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. So, and my footnote says, the Lord is our God, or the Lord our God is the only God, or the Lord our God is one. So there's several ways that that can be translated. Seventh-day Adventists have a set of 28 fundamental beliefs. And one of the early ones is the one on the triune God. And let me just read that to you and see if you all fully agree with that. Any questions about it? There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That sounds like a contradiction already, right? A unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and, ev and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension yet known through his self-revelation. He is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. Any questions about that? Yeah, I'd say the, the middle, middle there, these beyond human comprehension, pretty much eliminates much discussion about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it, can't, it can't be contradictory, though. I mean, lots of people will, will look at something and say, well, this is, sounds contradictory to me. Well, that's because it's too deep. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, you can use deep for, for race and all kinds of ills, you know. And, and truth may not have an explanation. Yeah, when, when the, when yeah, the, truth always has an explanation. We may not have one now. Yeah. Sometimes it seems like when the questions get kind of hard to say, well, those are answers we'll have to get in heaven. Yeah, yeah that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. Well, however, remember that we have, we have discussed in this class on a number of occasions the idea that faith is based on a relationship with God. And in order to have a relationship, you have to know something that you're relating to. So it's pretty important that we get some kind of an idea about what this, what this God is like, what he amounts to, and, and what he's trying to say to us about himself primarily. 
and I don't, hope I don't need to tell any of you that there are three great monotheistic religions in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, who arose in that order, all descended from Abraham, or is Christianity not a monotheistic religion, but rather a polytheistic religion as Muslims contend? So what about it? Are we a, are we a monotheistic religion or a polytheistic religion? Well, my religion is a monotheist. Your religion is a monotheistic yes, religion. Okay. But I, I talk to some fellow people in my church, and it doesn't seem like they see it the same way. So, What do you mean by mono? One. I'm talking about not one in purpose, one in thought, one in this. I'm talking about number one, one as an amount. A numerical amount. A numerical amount. So there's amount. no Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Yes, there is. There is. In name. Not necessarily in personality. How about in finite manifestation? But there's only one infinite God, and if the infinite God could not create another infinite God, because it would just like a square circle. Well, yeah. But so he manifests himself as a Father, and as a Son, and as a Spirit, to uh, different at attributes for, for uh, finite understanding. So we, we couldn't have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are standing beside each other? Well, we conceptualize it that way probably, but... Uh, well, the, the, well, we have the purpose of that. We have the uh, imagery in Revelation where the... Son comes to the Father like they're and, and right, like the, yeah and, and getting into the same geographic area from from disparate areas. Say if, sitting on the right hand of God. And, right. and certainly, I mean, obviously, when Jesus was here on this earth, he wasn't the only God. Right. I mean, there was something in heaven at the same yeah. time he's he here on the earth. Talked to his Father all, mm -hmm. all the time. We we have in in past <clears throat> sessions mentioned that. Um, sometimes God uses analogies or comparisons because that's the only way He can communicate with us. That's as, you know we can't we can't understand so that He's used this as an example and so forth. And it would appear to me that that might be an argument why He appears so prominently as 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 a singular God in the Old Testament, although. We know that uh, there are passages in the Old Testament where you get glimpses of these of these other three personalities or characteristics or what have you. But saying saying that that recognizing that God sometimes it appears that God has to portray Himself in ways that you know we finite beings maybe kind of get some kind of what this infinite being is like. How do we know that that even the illustration that Norm has mentioned here just a moment ago of where the Revelation talks about coming together in one place, or how do we know that uh, the common Christian concept of, of three persons in one and so forth, how do we know that God isn't just uh, this infinite being, isn't even there trying to convey to us something as best He can to communicate to our infinite? How do we know that's really the way it is, that He's not yeah. just, you know, trying to communicate so there, that it isn't really that way, but... So, do you think God is intentionally deceiving us? No. Well, deception is the wrong word. He's... he's uh, Just fooling us. He's <laughs> <laughs> no, He's giving us something that, something that we can, you know... If He'd if it give the right God. thing, we, we couldn't understand it. So, He's trying to have some kind of a relationship, I, so He conveys I, it this way. I think that's very important, that if that if he were to pour out the truth, it would be right in front of us, but we couldn't understand it, as degraded as we are by sin, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I think that, for me, I, I, I see this as a God with potentials, uh, lives in dimensions that I have no, no ability to comprehend. Right. And if he needs another function, he can duplicate himself and perform that function, and if he needs three of them, he gets three of them. Kind of like an amoeba behind two posts or behind a wall with three holes in it, and you see three 
three things, you know, ah, three amoeba. No, it's, it's all one back there somewhere. And I think these three functions that we see in Scripture identified as three individuals, if we knew enough, if we had the capacity, we'd see that they were tied together back there somewhere. Yeah. Is, is, I'm, I'm going to turn the question around in one in certain respect. Is it important to you, for any reason that you can think of, to have a three-in-one God? Wouldn't we be just as well off with one? Well, or I three. Think I think the together. Trinity is a, a study about God that answers the question, how can God come down on earth and live with us? Okay. Um, how can he be there and then, then having the universe still being run by somebody mm -hmm. and yet have Jesus down here walking with us, teaching us and things like that? Do you think if you ask Jesus about some pebble on Pluto, he would know all about that? Probably. Yeah. You think he would? If you asked him? Mm-hmm. While he was uh, down here? While he was while, down oh, here. While, you're talking about while he was down here. Right. No, probably not. Probably not. So, you know, there's, there's a problem here that needs to be understood, and, you, and the Trinity is just a way to, to still get there and still have one God. Mm-hmm. But, but what about, um, and, and, I, and, and, and this I think is, I'm not sure everybody agrees with this, but I, I think we have heard this in our, Adventists have heard this in their basic theology, as that is that when Jesus came down here and became a human, there's certainly evidence that indicate that somehow he's going to be like us forever. For example, um, uh, when we're when we go to heaven, if I'm missing an arm, it's my understanding I'm going to get that arm back. Yeah. On the new earth, or in heaven, or wherever that time is, and wherever it is, I'm going to be as good as Adam was when he came. But you can be able to go up to Jesus, and you're going to be able to see those those nail prints in his hand. You can see where the sp spear went in his side. I won't have any of that, but he will. So, if if that's true. That throws another little kink in in this. It would appear to me in this. Well, in where's this. the kink? I don't see the problem. Well, there's one there. <laughs> Let me throw another kink. <laughs> yeah, but Paul does say that when we're re resurrected, we're going to have new bodies. A spiritual they're, body. They're, yeah, it's, they're going to be different than they are now. But um, recognizable. Recognizable, right? And Jesus could still be in the same realm as that and still exhibit some of these, these, um, you know. What whatever. he went through and what he did is the most precious thing that has ever happened in the universe. And, and the recognition of that and the, and the recall of that is what keeps sin from happening again. Why wouldn't he want to keep that? Hmm. That's the height of his glory. The, the maximum demonstration of his love. Some sort of... Well, that's a pretty big change to go from a God who can be any place and know anything to, yeah. to kind of be confined to, you know, a same immortal body that... I'll, I'll go to the know, middle sentence of the, first, of the first one. You, you can't know all about it. Well, <laughs> you, you know, you got to remember that he appeared in a building with the doors all shut. So... And when you well, say that he can't mm -hmm. go here, there, or the other, where... But you're getting ahead of our discussion. We need to... <laughs> we're we're going to come up to the deity of Christ in a little bit. I, I want, we're, I'm going to talk about the general issue of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Ellen White, yes? Well, one, one analogy I've heard is the United States government. There's one government in the United States, but there are three branches. There's the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. And they you can't know? agree. <laughs> well, they don't frequently, usually. In fact, they're even, even amongst, in, in any one division, they can't agree. But, uh, you know, that's another comparison of there are three but one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ellen White was helping to establish Avondale College in Australia back in April of 1899. She'd been there for something like eight years already. And she, she was meeting with the student body and talking to them about 
the fact that, you know, God was present among them. And she said, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who, has, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. That the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. Now that's found, the easiest place to probably find it is in Evangelism, page 616, paragraph 5, or possibly Faith I Live By, page 52.2. But what does that tell us about the nature of God? Well, we can't well, understand it. Mm -hmm. Why did you, why, why even bring that up in this discussion? Because in general, we, we, we tend to say the Father, yeah, we can sort of picture him somehow or other. And the son, oh yeah, we have no problem with him. We, 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 he was here on this earth and so forth. But the Holy Spirit, you know, what, you know, is he a essence or is he, you know, a wind? Is he a whatever? She says he's a person and he's walking through these grounds. Well, God is a person. Yeah, that, that's what she said. So everything, I mean, all three of those names are a person. Okay. The same person. But they so appear I don't to know have what different the problem functions. is. It, it, well, a different emphasis. Is, it seems I think. to me that the text is Moses trying to inculcate this concept into the children of Israel after <laughs> they got out of Egypt with all the gods of flies and everything that moved and grunted or whatever they worship. I think there's an overlap here. I don't have a problem with one. The other thing it is, if you look at the early Christian history post Christ's ascension. This has been going, arguments about this have yeah. been going on for hundreds, thousands of years. Now, now there's, there's another thing that comes to my mind. If, if you start talking about the Holy Spirit as walking around, doing, doing things, you know, around these people, well, what about the people in South Africa that are praying for the Holy Spirit? Do we have to, do they pray and they have to wait until he says, oh, I'm done here, and walk clear no. around to the other side? Well, you know, if you start using those illustrations, um, you know, you start thinking that way. If you take them too far. Well, in the Scripture, this is from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. In Scripture, there are three separate but interrelated types of evidence for the Trinity. This is what we want to look at today. Three separate kinds of evidence. One, evidence for the unity of God that God is one. We've read one verse and we've talked some back and forth about a little bit. Two, evidence that there are three persons who are God. Are they all equally God? And three, subtle textual hints of God's three and oneness. So, uh, just to start off, can you think of some hints from the Old Testament that there's more than one God? No, because every time I read it, I see one God. Now, if you you have a predisposed to that, you could probably see it. But I interpret all that as one God. Well, in, in Genesis, for example, right at the beginning, it says the Spirit was... The Spirit of God moved over the face of the that, water. That's right. And uh, so it would be reasonable to assume that that's... Um, so when Pluto, putting, putting other things together... <laughs> So if an astronaut's on Pluto and the Spirit is hovering over the waters over here, he's got to wait till he's done over there before he can no, go to no, Pluto. No, 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 no. Well, I, I don't know what the same way you were using a minute ago. I know, it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And it's not, you, you, you can't use that argument if you believe God is everywhere present. Well, then why can you use that to say that he's three gods then? And if I mean, you're, you're going, you can't have both of them. And, Why not? I and, know. And if he is everywhere, he would have been everywhere at the creation. Mm -hmm. So why are we making a special note that God is here at the earth? His, his spirit is, is here when it would be everywhere. Well, because he's doing something special here at this point in time, and we see what he's accomplishing. That's why Jesus said in John 3, I got to go. Well, in, well, in John 3, he said, you can see the trees bend over when the wind comes. You can see various things. You see lots of manifestations of the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind. He says the Holy Spirit is like that. <coughs> and of course, in Greek, which I know much better than the Hebrew, the word for wind, the word for spirit, 
the word for air is the same. So if you can't see the wind, you can't see the spirit, how in the world do you know that he has legs and he walks around? Has because, anybody seen him? Because it says that in the inspired source. That's why I quote it. Otherwise, I wouldn't quote it. <laughs> well, I just saw the back of him. It doesn't come I, right out, but it infers God walked by him. How? We don't know. Walked by I think it's a question of focus. God wanted us to focus on these three separate things. It's almost like three four-star generals all working toward the same end. But the, let me use another verse. Daniel seven thirteen. During this vision in the night, and this here's talking about the judgment scene, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. What is that talking about? He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. So here is a judge presiding, and someone approaches him. Now, that does that sound like, I mean, again, it, this is a difficult thing. If you say both of these individuals are everywhere present, how can one approach the other? I mean, you, you could, you could, I understand that you could make a case like that, but God wants us to understand that there was a coming together, a, 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 a task to be accomplished in this judgment scene, and the father's involved and the son is involved. How are you going to present that if you say, well, they're, they're both just, uh, you know, everywhere present, uh, some kind of influence? Well, are we talking about something physical here, or are we talking about a concept? Well, he saw angels. He saw millions of angels surrounding God's throne. He saw someone sitting on that throne, that, and the throne was like fire, and then here comes an individual that looked like a human being approaching that throne. Oh. Is he seeing something physical, though, or is it, is it kind of a, a vision of a message type of thing? Or, or well, you're, you're, what, you're, what, you're, what you're trying to do is take me back to Plato's argument. Basically no, no, said, no, don't go to Plato. cognito don't go ergo to Plato. sum. You can't, prove anything, you can't prove anything except that I exist. Because you can always say that. How do I know that you're really there? Well, I don't know for sure, but I think you're there. See, right. you, you can take any argument to that level. We're not going to go there. <laughs> but, you know, if you, have, if you have the son who's been walking on the earth, mm -hmm. he's not, he's, he's taken a finite form, mm -hmm. but yet there's still God, the, the infinite, mm -hmm. is still there. Mm -hmm. These two forms would kind of come together as, as Jesus leaves to go to heaven mm -hmm. and to present himself to God. Mm -hmm. So you've got You've got those two coming together there. Okay. And I don't necessarily say that we've got two different beings there. Of course, it, and once again, the argument could be made, well, this is the only way God can convey to us yeah. something about, it, about the judgment. But then, you know, what do we do with the, what do we do with the, the, the concept that, uh, you, you know, when this earth is made new, this is going to become the center mm -hmm. of his uh, his his uh, throne, basically. Mm -hmm. So God's dwelling place. There, there's, yeah, there's got to be somehow. There's got to be some kind of a, a concentration of personality. Okay. So <laughs> a couple, a couple, a couple of things. That's pretty good. Uh, a <laughs> couple of things we need to, and we need to. I think we need to try to look at the biblical evidence. We could, we sit here and philosophize all night long. Exodus 3, 13 to 15, God appears to Moses as a burning bush. The bush isn't consumed, and he starts talking to Moses, and he says, Moses says, what is your name? And he said, I am. I am who I am, or even I will be who I will be. Uh, it's a difficult, it's, it's, it's almost an untranslatable expression. It's almost like the verb to be, you know. Some have translated the, the eternal or the self-existing one. That's one side of it. The other side that I'd like us to consider is, is found in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Look at that one. Then God said, and you, now you're going to think I've changed the subject, but just hold on mm -hmm. for a moment. Then God said, and now we will make human beings that will be like us and resemble us. 
They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic, wild, and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them, and said, have many children, so descendants will live over the earth and begin under their control. But so, <clears throat> we're at, we're at um, verse 27 here, well, and I, I probably should bring one of the more traditional translations here where it'll be a little more obvious. It says, in verse 27, it says, they will be one. And the word there for one is the same word that's used for God being one. So, how does that fit? Do we believe that these two, in a marriage, those two become one? That's in Genesis, right? Uh, well, it's repeated a number of other places in the Bible, but I was quoting well, from Genesis, yeah. Okay, but didn't you say that um, the vocabulary was not that huge in the old Hebrew? Well, the, the question so, isn't, the, that's not the question. The yes, question, it is, because right. you're, ca you're talking about either Norm and me being one because we agree, or mm -hmm. that we, um, we, ha we both have hair, so on, as far as hair goes, um, we, we agree, and we're one on that. Well, or but, you can but God says that the male and the female are supposed to come together and they're supposed to get married and they're supposed to become one. And it's the same word one that he uses for the oneness of God. And that's what I'm saying, that, that the same word one, there is no other option to go So you're to. saying well, they're not really the same, it's just that limited well, vocabulary have, you have, have to many, use that word. They've <laughs> had many meanings for one word. Mm -hmm. Depending on the context. Well, look, look at, look at, here's the verse that, uh, that goes with it, Genesis 2, 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one. There's the, the, the expression one. Yeah, I would, I would go flesh. with that if their vocabulary was bigger, and they had, <laughs> they had other words that could differentiate between one there. You don't think if, if God really wanted to say there was something different here, he would have invented a new word? I mean, this is the beginning of the history of mankind. He could have invented any word he wanted. Well, no, not necessarily, because we know that the, the language back then was limited because of the writing. I think that as a matter of scriptural interpretation, the first principle is you take it literally if you can. And if there's something in it that, that just says it, it can't be literal, then you go to some other uh, type of interpretation. But to, to start with the idea that limited language, so you can't understand what it says, I think puts no, the no, wrong emphasis there. I didn't say that. I'm just saying that, that I don't think there's enough power there to, to make that separation. That for, whatever that reason, gonna... for whatever reason, God said, we three are one just as the husband and wife are one. Now, you can expand that term or compress it as, as you like, but that's the, that's the information that God gives us. And, and uh, another thing, to it seems to me, to, to observe is that if, if God is doing the best he can to communicate to us what he is really like, then this is... This is the information he's given us. That's right. Mm -hmm. And although uh, we in our little finite minds may not be able to come to absolute, complete, and full understanding, evidently there's enough here that we can, that we can find a security, an assurance. And also, when you're in this Christian experience long enough, and you know that, that, that your experience and your understanding grows. Mm -hmm. and changes and enriched and, and... Uh, but I think yeah. that we, we're missing something here. That one has two or three meanings. Mm -hmm. A man and a woman, yes, they're different sexes, but they're mm -hmm. the same species, for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. You get married, you're supposed to look after each other like the opposite one is the same as your body, and I think God wants to do that with us. He wants mm -hmm. us as one. John it's not 17. just the number one. There's a whole concept here that we, yeah. we're missing. Well, now let's 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 put it. Let's test our understanding of what this divinity versus humanity kind of stuff means. And, and the real challenge is when you deal with Christ when He was here on this earth. Okay. 
almost no one div questions the divinity of, of the Father. Very few people really challenge the divinity of the Holy Spirit. They may have some different ideas about what he is, but they, that, that's relatively unchallenged. But from the, almost from the time Christ left this earth, people have come up and challenged his divinity in various kinds of yeah. ways. And certainly while he was on the earth, too. Even while he was here on this earth. Um, look at some places. Look at Philippians 2, verse 6, for example. He always had the nature of God. This is talking about Christ. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. So something happened. Uh, he came down to this earth. He was born as a little tiny baby boy. He passed through the vaginal canal. I mean, he did everything like a human being. But yet, we have these words from Desire of Ages, page 530. Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. And Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. So that doesn't leave much leeway as far as whether or not Christ is, was in fact divine. Is it important that Christ is divine? And if so, you know what I'm going to ask next, why? If he wasn't, anybody could have fulfilled the, That's the right. price. If, if something other than divinity could have accomplished the purpose, then it would have. Okay, well, why would it have to be divinity? Because the charges were about divinity. Okay, because, and here's... Well, because he said that he's the only guy that, that said that he can lay his life down and bring it back up again. Mm -hmm. So if he's the only one that can so do if that... I, if, I, if I said that, would it be all right for me to do it? Well, you can say it, but you won't be able to do it. Okay, well, so you're saying that the proof of uh, uh, one of the important aspects of his divinity, that he was actually able to do that. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Fair enough. Why is that important? Why is what important? That he was able to lay down his life and take it back up again. And, and the verse, the famous verse for that is John ten eighteen, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's just look at that real quick. Um, here it is at the top of the page. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up. I have the right to take it back. This is what my father has commanded me to do. I can lay it down. I can take it up. And it's his ability to do that <laughs> that gives him the ability to take me, who is dead in sins, and give me something that can live. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's start with the very first argument. Yes. Uh, where it said, uh, I have the right to do this, I have the right to take it up. Uh, RSV says I have the power. Mm -hmm. And I think power is probably a little bit more precise yeah. because uh, a right, we get our rights from the Creator God, uh, but this, it, we're not dealing in, with in, rights and duties, we're dealing with power. In, in the Greek, there are two words. One is authority and the other is dynamite. Okay. And this is not talking about the dynamite, although <laughs> we would we would agree that he had the actual power to do it. But this is using the word authority. He has, a, he has the authority and the means to actually accomplish it. I think you're, you're spoke on, focusing on the means. He, he was able to do it. No, right. still thor authority would be still a, a matter yeah. issue of power, and it's yeah. not an issue of right. Yeah. So, so what was your original question in regard okay, to here's, this? Here's the point. This Back is. in the beginning, Lucifer apparently stood on one side of God's throne, and Christ stood on the other side of God's throne. And Lucifer said, why are you favoring this guy on the other side of the throne, taking him into the divine councils and so forth? Why aren't you including me? And God says, because you're a creature and not a creator. He says, how can I tell that? I mean, this, this guy over here, he moves among the, people, the angels as, an, as Michael the archangel. It looks like every other angel. I'm an angel. What's the difference between us? So one of the big arguments back at the beginning is, <coughs> is there an essential difference between Christ who moved among the angels an angel, later moved among us as a human being, is there something about him that is essentially different than a created being? Yeah. Well, if you can give your life up and take it back anytime you want, there's something different about you. Yes. Well, plus everybody 
everybody, all the creatures have to go through him to get to God. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he, he is kind of the face of God right there. He's, he's the, the, the object he, you he look is, at. He is, the, he is the, the, the member of the Godhead, if you want to call it that, the person of the Godhead that relates to creatures. That's one of his main, his main That's function. His function. His function. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what happened at the, at, at, and again, now I'm going to turn to Ellen White. You can, you can get this from the Bible, but it's, you have to sort of read between the lines. She says it very specifically. What happened at the resurrection that proves that Christ was divine? Remember? Your father calls you and he... Two angels, up. Ellen White says, two angels came down from heaven. One rolled the stone back and the other one says, Jesus, your father calls you and he came forth from the tomb in his own power. Now, none of us human beings were there to observe that. <coughs> Not a single human being observed that. The, the hundred human beings that were there were lying flat on the <laughs> dead as doornails, as you will, almost with their noses in the dirt. They weren't watching. But the universe saw it. And the universe is the one who, who they were the ones who saw the, the argument back in the beginning. Sure. They're the ones who needed to see the answer. Now, we need to finally realize what the questions were back at the beginning, and then we need to realize that we need to accept their testimony from, from inspired sources that, in fact, he was able to do this. But if that testimony is accurate, and I absolutely believe it is accurate, that's inspired, then here God, God just proved in, no, in unquestionable terms that Jesus Christ is not just a creature like every other creature. So he said, the angel says, your, your father has called you. So how does that... How does I don't understand how that proves that he rose well, because on his because own. he rose from the dead. It's like you someone might come into your room when you're dead asleep and say, "Gary, wake up," and you. But that person didn't instill any power on you. You woke up on your own. In the same way, this angel said, "Jesus, your father calls you," and Jesus woke up from the dead, from what we would call the second death in his own power. After being totally and completely separated from God on Calvary and buried in the grave, the stone rolled in front, it, the angel says, I have been sent by your father to call you. And Jesus rose from the dead in his own power. The angel had no power. He just, uh, just presented the message. Yep. Jesus well, didn't tell Lazarus when he was lying in the tomb Lazarus, your father calls you, yeah. and have Lazarus come out. He said, you, Lazarus, I'm telling you, under my power, come out. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that's, not, that's not that, the issue. Isn't that kind of the father calling him? No, it was, a, it was through a third party. Yeah. Third party. The father has, the angel, father's calling you, okay. and now he responds on his own. It seems to me that Christ was aware of this factor of the resurrection before he died. Because yeah. if you look at the end of 18th verse, I got the New American Standard. It says, this commandment I received from my Father. Mm -hmm. He knew. Yes. <clears throat> that's part of what he came. I mean, it's, that's part of one of the many questions that he came to this earth to answer. And that's how he answered it. Yeah. Now, let's look at some other examples. I mean, let's look at, get as, as much evidence as we can. Um, the Jews believed that illness was the result of sin. You know the famous John 9 verses 1 and 2 thing where the disciples saw the blind man and what did they say? Is this guy blind because of his sin or because of his parents' sin, right? It was clear to them that any person who suffered from serious disease must be a serious sinner. So look at Mark 2, 5 to 10. Seeing how much faith they had, I'm reading from my Good News Bible, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, now here's the story of, of they, apparently four or five or more people had brought this paralyzed man on a stretcher. They tried to get him into the house, probably Peter's house, where Jesus was preaching, and they just couldn't crash through the crowd. So they went up on the roof, tore open the roof. I mean, they, they actually made a hole in the roof and let this guy down. And what did Jesus say? Thy sins be forgiven me. Yeah. Pick your bed up and go home. Well, he said, first your sins are forgiven. Yeah. And what did the Pharisees were standing on? What did they say? Blasphemer. 
blasphemy because what? Nobody can forgive sins but God. Only God can forgive sins. But they had, they had just painted themselves in the corner because what did Jesus do next? He says, buddies, which is harder to do, to forgive a sin or to heal this guy? Well, see, to them, there was no difference. If you're a sinner, you're paralyzed. This guy's a terrible sinner. That's why he's lying on this bed like this. So Jesus says, I forgive your sins. And the guy's just still lying there. They said, well, obviously, you know, he hasn't solved the problem. So what does Jesus do? So get get up, up and walk. Take your walk, take your bed and walk out of here. And he did, proving that he could do what? Forgive In sin. their thinking. Forgive sin. Forgive sin. And what do you say at that point? Nothing. You see, they had already set up the criteria for God. God is someone who can forgive sins. Jesus forgave sins and he proved it by having the guy walk out. Okay, what's the conclusion? He's God. He's God. They, they, they painted themselves. Now, we wouldn't make that same conclusion today, but... Because he could still heal a sinner, that unrepentant sinner, assumingly he could still raise him up and, and yeah. heal him. Why, yeah. why, would, why wouldn't that also prove that your sins are actually the consequence of, your, of his circumstance? In a sense, you can be right. I mean, if you drink yourself silly, you're going to end up an alcoholic demet. But I, the, the, this has a wider sense. It mm -hmm. goes back generations, which I don't think is necessarily true. Now, near the end of Jesus' life, and especially after his resurrection, a number of disciples came, and when they saw him, they bowed mm -hmm. down and worshipped him. Would it be wrong for Jesus to accept worship if he were, if he were not God? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Where would you go in the Bible to prove that? Oh, Daniel or Revelation where an angel comes down and Daniel's on his nose and, yeah. and the angel says, ah, nah, ah, ah, don't worship me, get up. Mm -hmm. Daniel 19.10 is a good example. Mm -hmm. Daniel 19.10. Uh, I'm sorry, Revelation 19.10 is a good example of that. Um, so let's look at some other bits of evidence that we might have. Um, I was just thinking about when the person came up to Jesus and called him good teacher, or good master. And he says, why call me good? Mm -hmm. Only God is good. Mm -hmm. So um, what was he doing there? Well, what was the rest of the discussion? Well, it was about... He, 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 Jesus, <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus said, you know, what, is the, what does the commandment say? And the man answers the right. commandments and so forth. So Jesus was saying, he, he wasn't saying, I'm not good. He's saying, why are you calling me good? He's saying, do you recognize me as God? Or are you just testing me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a lot there. Yeah. In that yeah. little discussion. Okay, let's, let's, let's try something out. Look at John 19, 7. Here we're talking about the trial of Jesus. And remember that in that trial, what did the crowd answer? They, what did they say? We have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Okay? That's, that's the first part of it. Now look at Matthew 26, starting with verse 63. Sorry, I can jump around a little bit easier get there quicker. than you can. <laughs> and let's just start with 62. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Have you no answer to give to this accusation against you? But Jesus kept quiet. Again, the high priest spoke to him, In the name of the living God, I now put you on earth, oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, Jesus has got a problem here, in one sense. What's the problem? If he says, I'm the Son of God, they say that's blasphemy and we'll crucify you. If he says, I'm not the Son of God, he's know, lying he's under oath. lying, yeah. So Jesus answered him, so you say. But I tell all of you, from this time on you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right of the Almighty and coming on the clouds of heaven. And boy, they understood. They didn't want to, Caiaphas, remember, didn't believe in the afterlife. He believes this life was the only life there is. And he wasn't happy to hear those words, I can assure you. Well, he was already very upset with Jesus because of the Lazarus deal, wasn't he? I mean, here was somebody walking around in the community 
who had been dead for four days. You know, and that's not supposed to happen. So, and and was a, a testimony to uh, to the validity of of Jesus theology in contrast to uh, the, the theology of Caiaphas and his colleagues. Our Christian friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, do not believe in the divinity of Christ or the Holy Spirit. To them, Christ is a created being and there's only one God, the Father. Some prominent early SDAs had similar beliefs. Why do we baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If we forgot to mention one of them, would that make the baptism invalid? Of course not. Of course not? Of course not. But, um... Minister's nervous. Uh, <laughs> it'd be. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask you, you know, how do you, how do you listen? Why, we, li we hear these things. What do we make of them? What do they mean to us? Well, they could keep going on and say the Shekinah glory, the, the pillar of the, the pillar by night, Pillar, pillar of fire, of God, by, the pillar of fire, pillar of fire by the burning bush. They can baptize in all those names. Okay. They can just keep going. Is there anything in Scripture that says you have to baptize in the name of these three? Well, or is Matthew that twenty-eight nineteen says that go for go go therefore and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Then that's probably the reason we yeah. do it. Yeah. But I'm asking you, is you know, it's fine that the Bible says that. Do we understand why we're doing it? We're we just well, blindly it, it, following it, scripture. It, isn't that just kind of? We could say, "I baptize you in the name of God," mm -hmm. and if you understood that, the, the whole Godhead, uh, mm -hmm. that would be fine. So I suppose it's just a matter of ex making it a little more explicit to who you, who the power is you're talking about. Okay, let, let's let's. What do our Jehovah's Witness friends say when they come to that passage? To which passage? I tell you, uh, when he sent them forth to baptize in... in oh, the I'm not, I haven't talked to them specifically about that passage. They would say that Christ is a lesser God. The Holy Spirit is closely linked with the incarnation of Christ on this earth. Notice these specific details. One, when announcing the birth of Christ, the angel tells Mary that her child will be called holy because the Holy Spirit will come upon her. Luke 1.35. Jesus claimed that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, anointing him to preach. Luke 4.18. He also claimed to be driving out demons by the Spirit of God. Matthew 12.28. The Spirit which is to carry on Christ's work after his departure is another counselor of the same kind. What does that mean? Same God. Same, same God. character, same characteristics. Mm -hmm. Just a little different function. Okay. In what way are the Holy Spirit and Christ of the same kind? They're both members of the Godhead. Both members of the Godhead. What does it mean when it says, John 20, verse 22, Jesus breathed out the Holy Spirit upon his followers? What? We, we use these terms and then we... That's in, a tricky one. <laughs> in what context was that? I mean, oh, let's look at it. John 20, verse 22. And the context here, if you, if you look back up there, is Jesus appears to his disciples late this, that Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors. Remember, the, okay. the people from Emmaus had come back because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, they said. After seeing, saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. This was his first appearance to them. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you, receive, if you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You know, it drives you crazy if you start looking at it physically. But if it's conceptually, it doesn't, you kind of understand it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Christ brought the Spirit with him. He was introducing a new concept because he knew he was going to leave and the Spirit was mm -hmm. going to take over, but that didn't preclude him or stop him from helping us either. To me, it would say the same thing if he said he breathed himself on them. 
It's, okay. it's all the same thing. Well, new Christians will have both the indwelling Holy Spirit, John 14, 17, the next verse, yeah. and also the Spirit of Christ, Galatians 2, 20 and Colossians 1, 27. So when we say the Spirit of Christ, does that mean the Holy Spirit? Yes. <laughs> no, I think Christ... I think Christ is not ignorant of what's going on down here. At the time of the baptism of, of, of Jesus, he, John takes him, he says, I want you to baptize me. Jesus goes down into the water. John baptizes him. He comes up and what do we hear? Well, Scripture says we hear the voice of the Father. Right. And then what else happened? The dove came dove. Down. Dove. Representing the Holy Spirit came down upon him. What does that teach us about? That wasn't there a voice there, and there's a dove here, and there's a person here. Isn't that three? Mm -hmm. To me, it's a visual aid. Mm -hmm. Here's God, the Father. Here's the Son. A pointer comes down. They're connected. Okay. That's well. How, tell me how you'd connect this one. This is from historical sketches. This is Ellen White's <laughs> comments about uh, her travels in Europe in 1885 to 87. When they, Israel, came to Sinai, he took occasion to refresh their minds in regard to his requirements. That would be the ten, giving of the Ten Commandments. Christ and the Father, standing side by side upon the mount, with solemn majesty, proclaimed the Ten Commandments. I can't explain that one. You can't? <laughs> I have, to, I have to admit that. But there aren't too many like that, so I... <laughs> I think maybe... So you're playing the percentage? No, no, no. I, well, you can up to a point, especially when there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Well, Christ, the New Testament apostles often spoke of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. Acts 2, 33, 1 Peter 1, 1 to 3, 2 Corinthians 1, 20 to 22, 2 Corinthians 3, 14, 13, 14. 15. Let's just look at that one, for example. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now there's all three mentioned in one verse. Christ is repeatedly described as being seated at the right side of God the Father in the place of honor and then being given the Holy Spirit. Why was Christ given the Holy Spirit? Where's is it now? Be yes? This is after his humanity, is it not? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the answer. Was it because the Holy Spirit is now to do in Christ's place what Jesus could not do after becoming human? I don't know what that means, though. Okay. Tell me about your doubts. Well, I just don't understand what that means. I mean, what are you saying when you say that? What well, sounds like Christ now in his human existence, his human form, let's say, in heaven, is given, the, Ho the Holy Spirit has said, okay, let me do for you what you can't do anymore because you're now in human form. And Christ says, okay, this is what needs to be done. That, that needs to be done. Which we need to have running the universe. Godhead with us moment by moment, every place on earth. That's and right. Jesus' physical form couldn't do that. That's right. So the Holy Spirit takes over and it becomes our comforter instead of Jesus physically. Ken, you, you said something earlier that kind of caught my attention. Uh, um, and I, uh, that was a little different to me and, and maybe I misunderstood. But you made reference to um, Jesus uh, being kind of the... Um, uh, kind of the one who's uh, worked with the angels. Mm -hmm. Michael the Archangel. Right, and that was kind of his work. That was his, this, uh, when it came to the gods uh, interacting with the angels in... And later with in, human beings. That's right, in, in kind of their work is divided up. That, that's kind of what Jesus did. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit, he did some other things. And, and now that... that Jesus is in human form and, and may not have that ability as, as like he once did. He has to, 
he's asked the Holy Spirit to, to do that. Is, is, I, I guess where I'm going there is, you know, he talks, it mentions once about my, the Holy Spirit will now yeah. come to you and so on and so forth. Is it, am I way out in left field here? Well, he said, there are lots of things I'd like to tell you, but I can't yet. Mm -hmm. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> He'll explain things to you. I think we're talking about the essential functions of these three members of the Godhead. And they are spelled out, if you, if you want to spend some very profitable time trying to understand this question, John 14 to 16. Just, it goes on and back and forth and up and down. I mean, that is by far the most exhaustive, comprehensive description of the, of the, the Trinity and their functions in the entire Bible. And obviously, we don't have time to do that now, right now, but there's where you would go to see all of that. Um, well, you know, the, the big thing that I, I see that's a problem here is that what if there was no Trinity? The Trinity wasn't mentioned at all. And, yeah. and then, God, then Jesus came down on this earth here and did what he did, and he said he was God. Mm -hmm. You would get up, you would get kind of a shallow idea of what God is by looking at him about what, what he was doing at that time. When you have a God that's supposed to take care of the whole universe and now he's there, you know, um, without the Trinity, the, the speaking of the Trinity, there would be no way to, to reconcile all this stuff. Yeah. Well, and people have struggled. Christians, even people claiming to be Christians have really struggled with this. Back in the beginning, People, some, one group said, no, Jesus was not, Jesus was really just a person, but God came down and inhabited him as a person. Another group says, well, Jesus wasn't really God, he was just a really good person that God sort of adopted into his family. They struggled with that. Now, here's, here's what our, our, our Bible study guide says, and I'd like you to think of this in conclusion. If Jesus were merely a created being and not fully God, how could he as a creature bear God's full wrath against sin? What created being, no matter how exalted, could save humanity from the violation of God's law, or even God's wrath? Were Jesus not divine, then God's law would not be as sacred as God himself, because the violation of it would be something for which a created being could atone. The law would be only as sacred as that created being, and not as sacred as the creator. Sin itself would not be so bad if it, all it took to atone for it was the death of a creature. Sin in itself would be, um, sorry. The fact that it took God himself and the person to remedy sin presents powerful evidence of the seriousness of sin. And I would like to leave in what dwelt, uh, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but it wasn't in his humanity. And I'm going to leave you to think about that. See you next time.